do it, but shit. Oh my god. Aerodynamics of maneuvering flight. You guys ready? Let's do this. This will finish up chapter three. Cha Good news is chapter four is more about airports and airport lighting and some safety and you know how to look outside the windshield, make sure you don't crash into another airplane. Uh, th this is one of the tougher uh, sections and we like to get it out of the way, you know, in the beginning while we still have a little mental capacity is, uh, you know, go through aerodynamics and oh my gosh, what's going on with this thing. But like I said, and like I mentioned earlier, just a little teaser about you know, really what it is that we're getting ready to do. You know, you're, you're preparing yourself to step into an airplane and assume command of this airplane. Uh, you've got yourself on board. You've got some property, whether it's yours or somebody else's, and that's fine. But remember also, you're, you're flying this above other people. So there's a little bit of risk involved in it, a great deal of risk for someone that's untrained. And we do it in an accelerated manner. We do this within the first 10, 15, 20 hours of you ever flying anything ever a day in your life. Now you're in it by yourself. So yeah, a, a little bit of studying ahead, but I promise you uh, it is all enjoyable and it becomes all so much more rewarding once you take that first flight solo. And then you take your solo cross country and then you start enjoying aviation as a certified pilot. You know, now I can take passengers with me and I can fly where I need to go. Okay, that's great. Maybe I got an instrument rating and I can fly in different types of weather conditions, commercial pilot certificate where I can earn some money doing it and even airline transport pilot or whatever. I carry hundreds of people, you know, through a lot of different places. It, it, it is a great time. It really is. But in the beginning, there's just a change of mindset. And where have we been so far? Pretty much connected to the ground. You know, now you're going to fly something where the entire thing is controllable. You're controllable forward and back, left and right, and up and down. So that third little axis really creates a, 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 an interesting flavor in terms of uh, uh, our understanding of some of these things. Okay. All right, here we go. So like always, we can't change weight. We knew that. But you see where your thrust, drag, lift, and weight uh, axis are by the airplane, my vertical axis and my longitudinal axis. And we've been pretty good so far in section A and section B, aligning ourselves with that weight. Weight's the one thing that we can't change. So we're taking components of, and we're turning these into how much of this total lift or this total force, this total drag, thrust, whatever, aligns with weight and how much of it aligns with those other components that are 90 degrees too. So that's a component of weight acting perpendicular to the flight path. Then you've got your rearward component of weight. Okay. Something that we can't change always is weight. One thing that we have some control of is the flight path. Okay. Hopefully we have a lot of control of the flight path. And then that relative wind is the opposite and equal direction there. Okay. All right. Here's your direction of prop rotation. Let's talk about propeller driven airplanes. Gosh, they make us learn in propeller driven airplanes and they are the most difficult to learn how to fly. If I had a turbine airplane and it just had one jet engine in the back, that's a piece of cake. Okay. Cause I don't have all of these other turning forces that I'd have on a propeller, but because we use propellers, it creates a little bit of a problem. Let's go through and digest some of these problems. Number one is direction of prop rotation. So if I'm sitting in the cockpit, the prop is going to rotate clockwise. The same direction that I turn the key to start the engine, that's the direction that the prop turns. So I have thrust that's coming off of the propeller, but that thrust moves in a spiral. Okay. It moves in a spiral and it goes through the, uh, around the fuselage and affects some way that the, the airplane flies. Okay. The other thing that it does in, in even more, uh, more noticeable at slow air speeds is I have some torque or reaction force. So when you very first start to fly these airplanes, you're going to apply power. 
You'll apply power and uh, as you apply power, you'll notice that the airplane starts to move in one direction. That direction will always be the same one. And that is it's starting to move towards the left. Okay. So it moves towards the left because I've applied power and we have torque. What's this idea of torque? Okay. Uh, remember every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Remember we had that crankcase yesterday in the pistons and so forth. And we said there was a crankshaft that was moving in there. And besides that, that crankshaft was bolted directly to something. And that something is a propeller. This, all these somethings have mass. When these things move, the reaction is on the engine mounts and to the firewall and to the fuselage, there's an opposite reaction. So if I'm moving something in one way through internal combustion, there is an equal and opposite force. How much do airplanes weigh? The least amount possible. We can all agree on that. So they have to put an engine in it because it's not an airplane without an engine. And they have to put wings on it, but these wings are made out of lightweight material. And, and they have to put seats in it and they have to put radios in it. Okay, if I want to talk to somebody, I need a radio. Okay. It has to have all this stuff. Where's the majority of the weight concentrated? The engine. Okay. And fuel. Okay. But the engine is the majority of that weight. So this power producing engine, this power plant, if you would, when that creates a force in one direction, it will move the rest of the airplane. And that's what I get with torque. Okay. When you apply power and you get ready to take off, the airplane is not going to fly straight down the runway. It will not accelerate straight down the runway. It'll begin to move off towards the left and find all the uh, runway lights and everything else that's over there, all sorts of hazards. So I need to counteract that with some right rudder pressure. Okay. All right. Something else that happens is gyroscopic precession. Hmm. Yesterday we spoke about gyroscopes. We had a couple gyroscopic instruments. Do you guys remember what gyroscopic instruments we had? How many do we have? Okay, what were they? Heading indicator, turn coordinator, attitude indicator. Okay, how do those things work? Rigidity in space, right? I had something that was moving very, very fast and it, it stayed still. And then as the airplane banked or pitched that or changed direction, that caused me to have some indications inside the airplane. And what's going on with the attitude? What's going on with my rate of turn? This gyroscope at the front of your airplane is the exact same thing. It just has a whole lot more mass. It doesn't spin as fast. So the limits here are about 2,400 RPMs on the ground, 25, six in the air, okay? That, remember that gyroscope inside the instrument panel, that thing is 20, 30,000 RPM, but a much smaller piece of metal. This is a very large piece of metal. And as you apply pressure to that gyroscope, you will get a resultant force 90 degrees in the direction of rotation. Okay, hang on for a second. So I got a gyroscope out here moving around and around and around. If I apply a force here, that's the exact same thing as applying a force on that propeller, just like this. It's causing the propeller to move up. The propeller is moving in this direction. So 90 degrees in the direction of rotation. If I apply a force here, 90 degrees in the direction of rotation, I actually get a force on this side. Okay. So I will have some gyroscopic precession that I need to deal with in the airplane. Not terribly noticeable on the tricycle landing gear airplane. So the ones that we typically fly, when you pitch up, that actually causes a little bit of left yawing, or correction, a little bit of right yawing moment, which is what you want, because you normally use right rudder pressure in the climb. On a tail dragger airplane, this is a little bit more of a problem, because as that nose comes up, it also makes the nose go to the left, okay? So uh, for tail draggers is one of the ideas that we you know, go through and, and, and emphasize. You guys are not flying tail draggers for a little while, so it's okay, it exists, it's a concept. Let's talk about one that exists a little more. There you see, you got your applied force. The applied force was here. This case, the nose is coming up. 
It's the same thing applying force there, 90 degrees in a direction rotation that causes this tail dragger airplane, right? To yaw to the left. All right, we're not flying tail draggers. Okay, uh, there's a result in force, that's fine, we see that. Here's your P factor, or the asymmetrical thrust. Like I said, if this was a jet engine, you would just get thrust out of the back of it. It's not terribly difficult. You got a little bit of torque and a couple different things, but not a whole lot you need to deal with there. Here, we have propeller blades, and the propeller blades create an unequal amount of thrust. The reason it does that is because the climbing blade or the blade that's coming up has a lower angle of attack than the blade that's going down. You see the much larger angle of attack there. So that blade that's going down with a higher angle of attack, higher angle of attack, I get more lift. So I get more thrust out of the right side of the propeller. Which way is that going to cause the airplane to move? Well, here's my vertical axis. So if I apply more force here, it's going to cause that tail to come to the right, the nose to go to the left. Every time you climb in the propeller driven airplane, you got to apply right rudder pressure. When this becomes the most noticeable by student pilots in their program is on the power on stall. Okay. You guys remember if we we're making a, a power on stall, I wanted to avoid or any kind of stall. I wanted to avoid an offset of lift. I wanted to avoid different lift on the right and left wings. If I have more lift here and less lift here, what's going to happen when the airplane stalls? Well, that's uncoordinated flight. This is recipe for a spin. The way that the airplane is designed, I promise you, you will not spin unless you purposefully try to. Unless you actually pull back and hold the controls like this, it will not spin. But it will cause one of the wings to drop and one of the wings to stay up a little bit. And that's uh, upsetting to pilots. So to avoid this on your power on stall, low uh, airspeed, high pitch attitude, high power setting, just maintain sufficient rudder pressure. Right? I know that it requires right rudder pressure because that downward swinging blade creates more thrust. So I know that I need to do that, you just apply it. Your flight instructor is very, very good at helping you maintain awareness here, okay? I, by the time you guys fly with me, I, I let you do you know, whatever you do. <laughs> so you'll know how to use your right rudder pressure. And if you don't, then it's just going to fall like crazy and we'll say yeehaw. All right. Wow. All right. This is the spiraling slipstream. So like I said, the propeller is moving. It creates thrust, but that thrust comes around the fuselage of the airplane and strikes the uh, a vertical stabilizer. Okay. That creates a yawing moment as well. Yesterday we talked about a ground adjustable tab, a ground adjustable trim tab. Who did I say adjust the ground adjustable trim tab? Who does that? Mechanics. Mechanics. Okay. There is a rudder trim tab. It's there. That is a ground adjustable tab. Maintenance adjusts this based on uh, flight tests and so forth. Okay. So you do have one on the Cessnas. It's usually down here. This is a, it looks like a diamond, but these are available to help me maintain some uh, added directional control, uh, through a trim tab. Okay. So when you see that on there, you'll know what that is. Here, you've got your relative wind and now we got the airplane descending. So the airplane is descending. The uh, asymmetrical thrust still exists. So in a descending flight path with a propeller driven airplane, instead of using right rudder pressure, I will have a little bit of left rudder pressure. 
Just make the airplane fly straight. That's the key takeaway there. Here again, we got weight, which we can't change the direction. That always goes down towards the earth, but a component of weight acting perpendicular to the flight path. And then you got our opponent uh, acting horizontal too. Okay. I can control my flight path and relative wind is always opposite. All right, descent with power, uh, a power descent and a descent without power. Uh, perpendicular acting the flight path, that's fine forward, component of lift, and you've got weight, thrust, uh, lift and drag. Do you see how the four forces are not equal? Finally, thank goodness. <laughs> the books I think do worse than anything else. The books always make these four, uh, well, always. The books typically make these four things the same. They're the same length. But here you can see you got thrust and drag, those are equal, and lift and weight, okay? Here you got a smaller component of weight acting to the perpendicular of the flight path and the forward component of weight here. A little bit of drag without power, okay? So the different, uh, the different flight paths that I could have. Now, on this one, do I have unaccelerated flight? Well, it looks like it because thrust is equal to drag and lift is equal to weight. This one looks like the drag is slowing the airplane down. I don't have any thrust at all. So I've got a deceleration that occurs there. Weight is causing or allowing for this airplane to stabilize and to assume an unaccelerated flight condition. Without power, that's fine. What airspeed do I go to without power? Best glide speed. And I don't have any thrust, but the weight of the airplane is acting perpendicular, parallel to that drag. So the airplane will stabilize, it will maintain that. I just gotta descend, I gotta lose altitude. Aircraft performance is always a function of pitch and power settings. If I don't have any power at all, I still have control of the airplane. Or if I have a reduction in power, I still have control over the airplane. I just need to adjust my pitch accordingly. If I decrease my power and I try to maintain the same exact flight pitch, what's gonna happen? Well, I'll eventually stall the airplane. I'll exceed the critical angle of attack and then we'll go down. That's fine. If I try to slow down, right, which a lot of pilots do, I need to see you change the airspeed on the airplane. If you try to slow down, but you don't increase your pitch angle, well, then you just descend. The airplane will maintain the exact same airspeed. You won't slow down at all. So remember that aircraft performance and airplane performance is a function of Pitch and power, that's a combination of the two. All right, increasing lift to drag ratio and increasing angle of attack. Here's your LD max as the angle of attack, right? Here's your lift to drag. I get a lot more lift, a lot more lift, that's fine. LD max and then things start to taper off. For an increasing angle of attack, what's happened here when the uh, lift starts to taper off? I've stalled the airplane, okay? So at that stall, which you know, it depends on if, I'm, if I have accelerated flight or not, if it's just a 1G stall, that's fine, that's fantastic. I've exceeded the critical angle of attack that's generally 40 or so knots, okay? All right, best glide speed. Remember we're talking LD max for a moment. I said to maintain level flight, LD max, uh, to maintain level flight, and if I was below LD max, it required more power, right? So we we're doing our slow flight scenario. And I said, in order for us to fly this airplane slow, I had to increase that pitch angle and then increase power and continue to increase power. If I don't have any power on the airplane at all, if I fly at LD max or that best glide speed, that gives me my best distance or my most forward distance. If I fly the airplane faster than best glide speed, I'm not gonna make the best distance. If I fly slower than the best glide speed, I'm not gonna make the best distance, okay? 
So once that power fails or I'm experiencing either an actual engine failure or a simulated engine failure, it's important to maintain that best glide speed. Without best glide speed, we're not gonna get the maximum distance. If you're any faster than best glide speed, you won't go as far. If I'm any slower than best glide speed, you won't go as far, okay? All right. The angle between the component of weight acting perpendicular to the flight path, resulting in the same as the angle between the flight path and the horizon. And this is uh, the glide angle of the airplane. To maintain constant airspeed, any increase in drag must be offset by lowering the nose to increase the forward component of weight. This action in increases the angle between the component of weight acting perpendicular flight path and the resultant vector causing the glide angle to increase. All this is saying is I have a vector that's down. I can't change the direction that weight is happening, okay? But if I decrease my pitch angle, I'm using some of the weight, the actual weight of the airplane to offset the drag, okay? You will hear occasionally, and I try my best to stop it whenever I can. You'll hear occasionally pilots talk about they're going to control airspeed with pitch and altitude with power. That is a recipe for disaster. Okay? Just keep in mind that your pitch and your power will result in your performance. Okay? If I need to slow down the airplane, or if I want to slow it down less than LD max, I could do that if I add more power. If I don't have any power available, whether I'm doing a, a descent purposefully without power, or I have an engine failure, I don't have sufficient power, I can use some of the weight of the airplane to offset the drag, okay? But where's my flight path if I'm doing that? I got a flight path with an angle towards the ground, okay? So I can use some of the weight of the airplane to offset my drag, maintain a constant airspeed, but 100% my flight path will be angled towards the ground, all right? Does that make sense? All right, okay. Landing configuration, here we got uh, power off, airspeed at 105. Clean configuration. We were talking total drag before, and what came up earlier was, what if I had uh, flaps up or flaps down, which way do these curves react? And if I wanted to maintain the best distance for a glide, would I keep my flaps up or would I keep my flaps down? Here's that same curve, but it has the landing configuration curve just next to it. So at the bottom of this curve, this is my LD max. This shows me exactly what airspeed I would maintain for this airplane in a clean configuration for best glide speed. If I extend my flaps, this is great, I get more lift, but with more lift, I get more drag. So the entire curve shifts to left and up. I get a slower best glide speed, but I don't go as far. I'm not gonna have a, a, the same distance of travel. All right? You got your landing configuration power off. You can see my pilot has a much steeper angle there. And in the clean configuration, they got a much lower angle. The same exact thing that I have when landing an airplane, either in a clean configuration or in landing configuration with the flaps down. The idea behind the flaps are they allow me to clear plenty of obstacles prior to reaching the threshold, prior to reaching that touchdown zone, okay? In a clean configuration, I get more distance, but the angle is much lower, so I may not be able to clear those obstacles. I have to configure the airplane for my specific purpose. Am I trying to go further? Yes, wing flaps up. 
When we cruise the airplane, where do we have the wings set? With the wing flaps, wing flaps up. I'm in cruise flight, I have the wing flaps up. If I'm trying to land the airplane and I want to clear obstacles, and I want to maintain the shortest ground roll, so I don't want to increase my airspeed, now wing flaps down, okay? Wing flaps down to clear those obstacles, and maybe I'm not so concerned with how far we're going. We're already on top of the, the landing site, okay? Shouldn't we always maintain as uh, lower speed as possible when turned down? We should, and that is exactly what you're doing. Yes, but we have to practice it without because I may not be able to use my flaps under certain circumstances. If I have electrical failure, I can't use my flaps. So I have to practice all types of different emergencies to include maybe, maybe I have my emergency or my power shut off for a reason. Maybe I had an excessive load on the alternator. I had an excessive charge that could that could start a fire so i've got all the electric turned off i'm not going to turn the electrics back on to extend the flaps so how do i do that that's your forward slip to land yeah. but you're right and i'm glad you say that because we land the airplanes with full flaps make it as slow as possible you want to take care of the tires and all the landing gear okay other things that could affect, and this is the very first time that we're talking about us coming in contact with the ground and how our relationship is maneuvering the airplane uh, near the ground or ground reference maneuvers. If I have a, a wind that could affect my flight path, it will, it will affect my flight path, but it could affect my flight path while I'm landing and cause me to have a little different view, okay? And uh, strong headwind, this is my normal best glide speed flight path. If I don't adjust that, I may not make the, the runway because of the headwind. And a strong tailwind, there's the normal, and I have a decreased airspeed flight path. These headwinds and tailwinds are gonna affect you greatly while you're attempting to fly the airplane, okay? Especially in landing. We normally don't land the airplane with a tailwind. It's a normally don't. And especially a strong tailwind, not really at all. In a towered environment, the control tower will usually make you land on a runway with a headwind. A very, very light tailwind is acceptable and they'll probably go along with that. But you'll be assigned a, a runway with a headwind. In a non-towered environment, it's up to you as pilot in command to choose which one of these runways am I gonna to try to land on? And it's not uncommon for the pilot to land in one that has a tailwind. Now I should recognize that and come back around, but here's the reason why it definitely affects, uh, reflects your flight path. It affects it and it will affect your ground speed as well, okay? Vertical component of lift and horizontal component of lift. So aside from uh, descending and climbing and power on and, and so forth, how can I make this airplane maneuver? Well, if I bank the airplane, the lift is going to act just like so. Still horizontal or still perpendicular to that wingspan. And I'm going to have some lift that's opposite weight and I'll have some lift that is along the horizontal component. That horizontal component is what causes the airplane to turn. Okay, this is what's causing the airplane to turn. So we're gonna bank the airplane and cause it to turn. If I look at the total lift on the airplane, this total lift has to increase because if the total lift does not increase, I'm not gonna have enough lift here in the vertical component to offset gravity. What I get is I get a little bit of a load. Earlier we were talking normal category and utility category. And I discussed the amount of G force that we might have in normal category or utility category, right? 
So the G-force is a representation of how much percentage of my own mass or this airplane's mass do we have acting on the airframe? This is where we start exposing the aircraft to an increased load. And the load is the exact same for every bank angle in level flight. Okay, so I can predict how much bank angle I have and come over to find how much G-force I'll have as well. And a 45 degree bank, I got about one and a half or 1.414 times my normal load. And that's because I have to increase that back pressure to maintain level flight. I'm using some of my lift to turn the airplane. If I don't increase the load, if I don't increase my total lift, then the airplane will descend. I'll have a flight path that's aiming towards the earth. So for level flight, I got to increase that lift. All right. The vector sum, remember we were talking vectors the whole time. The vector sum of the horizontal component lift and the vertical component lift is the total lift provided by the wings. When adjusting the total lift so the vertical component lift equals total weight, the aircraft will neither gain nor lose altitude in the turn. So I want that lift to stay the exact same as weight. You guys agree on that? We're gonna make a, an unaccelerated flight vertically. I don't want it to climb, I don't want it to descend. But I'm gonna use some of my lift to turn the airplane's direction. This total lift, if you see, that's a much larger lift than what we had normally. So as you bank the airplane, you have to increase the elevator pressure. When I increase the elevator pressure, I feel it in the seat. I can feel it. And I also expose the entire airframe to more weight. Okay. Does all of that make sense? Has, who has not flown an airplane yet? Like actually flown one. Okay, so, so you don't really have uh, uh, experience in, in this idea yet. But try to, try to visualize for a moment that I have my airplane and it's creating lift and it's not climbing and it's not descending and everything is in equilibrium, okay? Once I bank the airplane like this, I get a little bit of that lift off to the side, right? Does that make sense? I get some of that lift that goes off to the side. But do you see how some of that lift as it goes to the side would decrease my total lift vertically? Let's say I did not increase my elevator pressure at all. And all I do is bank the airplane. That means that I get lift now created in this direction. That's good. I want to turn. But I get less lift in this direction. That would cause a descent. Okay. If I want a descent, this is okay. Sometimes I do. But if I'm trying to maintain level flight, there's only one way that I can do that. And that's by increasing the lift. How can I increase lift? One of those two things. I could speed up. Okay, good luck. You only got 180 horsepower. It's not a lot. Okay. What else could I do? An increased angle of attack. So increasing the angle of attack just means applying some elevator pressure. Now when I apply that elevator pressure, this lift will increase. That also increases the total lift here. Okay. Every force has an equal and opposite reaction, right? That equal and opposite reaction, this is my, my G load, right? How many G's I'm pulling in the airplane? Okay. So an airplane that weighs 2,300 pounds, if I bank it 60 degrees, 
I will get two times the amount of G-force, right? I'll get two times the load. So these wings and this fuselage are actually supporting 4,600 pounds of weight, okay? And the seat that you're sitting in is supporting two times however much you weigh, okay? All right, so just an idea of what's happening with G-loads. Now, obviously, and like we talked before, when we were saying normal category and utility category, there are some limitations to how much I can apply to the airplane. In normal category, I can apply up to 3.8 Gs. That's a lot, okay? Your headsets are gonna start falling off of your head at 3.8 Gs. You will know that you've reached that point probably before the airplane breaks, right? You'll know that something is not right, okay? And you'll also know that something's not right if you're less than your maneuvering speed. We'll talk about maneuvering speed. Remember yesterday I said we had a couple of speeds that were not listed on the airspeed indicator? One of them was VA, one of them was maneuvering speed, okay? The maneuvering speed is kind of important and we'll see a, a little slide here in a little bit. Okay, whoa. Adverse yaw, we talked about it. I bank the airplane one direction. If I bank it one direction, that makes the other aileron go down, which will increase my lift. Every time I get the increased lift, I get increased drag. That causes my inverse yaw, whichever way. This one, it has the airplane turning to the right. So I get increased angle of attack on the left side, increased lift over there, a lot increased drag, and that causes adverse yaw. How do I counteract this? Coordinated controls, yep. It takes a while, it takes some time to practice, but everyone will get it, I promise you. All right, inside wing moves slower while I'm banking and turning this airplane, guess what? Hey, well, engineers were pretty good at keeping the dihedral a little bit of angle here so that if I had shallow bank turns, it would return itself. So we had keel effect and so forth. If I, if I banked the airplane only a little bit, that would cause an increase in lift on this side and cause the airplane to fly straight. We were talking about insta with stability, but during that stability section, that just small bank changes would normally correct themselves. When I'm banking the airplane purposefully in a medium or a high or steep bank condition, I've got an airplane with a wing on the outside moving much faster than the inside. I'm just gonna leave that thing off. So the airplane has the wing outside here moving much faster. Same way I could take a, a string with a ball attached on the outside and just swing it around. Here I have a very slow velocity and on the outside it's moving very fast. It's the same thing. Well, how is lift affected by speed? So with an increase in speed, this wing is gonna create more lift. That will cause an overbanking tendency. Now, this is greatly exaggerated. You know why? Because number one, Everyone here has eyes and we all, know, we all know what we're looking for. And if I start seeing the airplane look like this, I'm gonna apply opposite aileron. I'll know to do that. It is very, very natural for me to do that. But the airplane will have an overbanking tendency. So although you naturally react like this, I can also predict that. I know I have coordinated controls into the steep turn, apply a little elevator pressure to maintain it, some power because now I have a heavier airplane. So if I want to maintain a constant airspeed, maintain a little more power and offset just slightly so I have a good sight picture, okay? And that's how we bank the airplane in a medium or steep bank turn, okay? Okay, radius. The airspeed's held constant, a larger bank angle will result in a smaller turn radius. So keeping your airspeed constant, 30 degrees angle of bank, 20, 10. You can see the radius. If the center of that circle were there, I got a much wider radius or a longer radius with a steep or with a shallower bank angle. Pilots are 
sometimes a little bit bad in the traffic pattern about maintaining their flight path. Okay. Remember if, if I have a traffic pattern, which this airplane's in a traffic pattern here, I have a runway right there. Okay. And if I have some sort of external force that's acting uh, on my airplane in a way that I don't want it to, such as wind, like maybe I have a crosswind and that crosswind is moving my flight path, my ground track that way. I need to add more bank angle. Okay. Because if I increase my bank angle, then I can stay in line with the runway instead of overshooting the runway. So one way to decrease the radius of my turn is by increasing the bank angle. Well, that's fantastic, but you guys might say, hey, we're close to the ground, we're getting ready to land. Why would I increase the bank angle? So if I'm close to the ground, why would I increase my bank angle? Well, as long as you're descending, you're not making any more load on the airplane. You're not gonna stall the airplane, the airplane's flying. Nothing about this this diagram mentions that we should fly the airplane slow or exceed the critical angle of attack. But sometimes I have to bank my airplane according to my desired flight path. If I want to make this airplane line up with the runway, bank the airplane more. There's nothing at all wrong with that, okay? Something else I can do. What about if I have a constant uh, bank angle and I decrease my airspeed? that also decreases the radius. So with a decreased airspeed, I get a much less, a much smaller radius, okay? So here I've got 100 knots, the airplane has a wide radius, a very wide radius. Turn rate, turn rate will decrease, but the radius increases greatly, okay? So with a faster airspeed, I get a whole lot wider turn radius. I can slow the airplane down, I can bank the airplane more, I can do a combination of the two. These are all things that can't be taught to each different circumstance. These are all decisions that you have to make individually for each specific uh, condition that you meet, okay? But what we do is try to give you enough tools that you know these are options, these are things that I can do. These are things that I have available to me to, to make my desired flight path a reality. I can increase bank angle. I can decrease airspeed. Naturally, I wanna keep the airplane flying, but I can do these things to make the flight path that I want. All right, a couple other things. Here I got bank angle and degree and load factors. We talked earlier, we said bank angle is exactly in a line consistent with, well, in a curve, excuse me, consistent with the load factor, okay? So if I bank the airplane in a level turn, I will get a load factor corresponding to that curve. Here, 60 degrees gives me exactly two times my load factor. That is in a level turn. If you're descending, you don't get the same load factor. These are only in level turns, okay? So if I wanna maintain the same altitude and I wanna maintain a 60 degree angle of bank, I have to put two times the amount of force on that airplane. It weighs 2,300 pounds, that's fine. Now it weighs 4,600 pounds. The airplane takes more power to maintain that at same airspeed. Okay. The maximum bank angle that you'll do in a private pilot program is 45 degrees. 45 degrees is here. And just like I said, that's, that's 1.414. So I'm only doing about one and a half times my normal load. Very, very small. Just a little bit, just enough to know that I can do it. Well, we've been talking level bank or level flight for a little while here. And let's say I don't want to make a level turn. Maybe I'm okay to descend. How much load factor will I have in a descending 45 degree turn? 
How much load factor? Maybe one. That's it. Right? So I'm not increasing any load at all on the wing if I don't increase that, that uh, elevator pressure. Okay? All right, same thing here, except percent increase in stall speed. I promised at the beginning we were gonna talk a little bit about some of these demonstrated stalls. You have to do a power on stall, you have to do a power off stall. That's fine. Some of the demonstrated stalls that you have, cross controlled, accelerated, what are these all about? Well, the accelerated stall means I'm gonna stall the airplane at a speed faster than the 1G stalling speed. So if I increase the load factor on the airplane, it will also increase my stalling speed. This is something that you'll do, you'll have demonstrated to you in the private pilot program, and we'll stall the airplane instead of the normal 45 knots, you'll stall it at 80 or 100 knots, okay? With that increase in load, remember, you also get that increase in stall speed. How can I avoid this and still manage a nice bank angle? Well, descend. Don't continue to hold back on the controls. If I want to bank and change my flight path and make a sharp turn, I can do that, even close to the ground. But allow the airplane to descend, okay? All right, load factor, VA, all this stuff. Uh, maneuvering speed, why is maneuvering speed not listed on the airspeed indicator? Well, because it changes. It changes based on load, okay? It changes based on how much the airplane weighs. This is a fantastic chart. Uh, yes, you learn a whole lot more about this chart in the commercial program than you do in the private pilot program, but we begin to look at it just a little bit. So this is zero load factor. What is zero load factor? What's happening on was what's happening at zero load factor? What's that? Yeah, you're 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 floating. This is kind of one of my fun ones here. It's called the floating penny. I have the person hold their hand out like this and put a penny in it, and then dec and then the, the penny will start floating in front of them, right? That's fine. We do that on unusual flight attitudes, all kind of your headset bag in the back is floating around. Okay, that's zero. Here you got one, one G. And I've got some you know, limitation with the airplane. Eventually, this thing is gonna reach a breaking point. Okay? So 3.8 Gs, like I mentioned for a normal category airplane, that's the breaking point. That's the positive limit load factor. Anything in here is called the envelope or where I can fly the airplane. On the outside of this is yeah, the airplane stalled. The airplane is positively stalled if I'm to the left. Anywhere that's, that speed is to the left of this or below, the airplane's stalled, okay? This is your negative limit load factor. Like I mentioned, minus 1.52. There it is, okay? If I want to fly the airplane much faster than this, I reach, well, I get the never exceed speed, okay? Never exceed speed, the airplane is gonna, something will bend or break or fall apart. So this is where I have to fly my airplane in order to not bend it or not break it. Okay, that's fine, that's fantastic. Here's your stalling speed, stall region. There's your maneuvering speed for whichever weight airplane I have, whatever, however I have my airplane loaded, what this tells me is that if I'm flying somewhere here, less than maneuvering speed, and I attempt to exceed the positive limit, or I try to achieve a uh, flight maneuver, which will cause the airplane to break, Something will occur first. So I'm flying less than stalling, or correction, less than maneuvering speed, and I increase the load, what happens to the airplane? Stalls. Can I recover from a stall? Easy, piece of cake, okay? Very, very easy, decrease pitch angle, decrease your angle of attack. If I'm flying faster than maneuvering speed, 
and I apply control pressures that increase the load, what happens first? I break the airplane. I exceed the positive limit load factor. The airplane's not gonna stall. Here, if I'm maneuvering speed or less, the airplane is gonna stall before this happens, okay? And that's how we'll, we'll demonstrate that during your accelerated stalls. We'll get you less than maneuvering speed, bank the airplane a good 45, 50, 60 uh, degrees, and then pull vigorously on the controls and the airplane will stall. It won't break, okay? Kind of food for thought, and we're gonna discuss this tomorrow during weather, and that is, what if I get into some very, very turbulent conditions? What if I get myself in a very turbulent condition and, and the airplane is difficult to control? How fast should I go? Should I go very, very fast or very, very slow or somewhere in the middle? Lower than maneuvering speed. Because if I'm attempting to control the airplane and I'm less than maneuvering speed, what is the very worst thing that's going to happen? Stall. I can recover from that. I can recover from that a lot better than I can recover from a broken airplane, right? That's difficult to recover. This thing here, you know, you don't want your airplane to look like this and fly less than maneuvering speed. 